So I'm taking the, summer, the Salzburg International Summer Academy of Fine Arts, early transnational and international connectedness as a starting point, and I would like to set out to take a closer look at some of these connections and relate it to a selected or by larger picture of post-war modernism that has its roots not only in locations of Western Europe, but in multiple locations around the world. In connection with the geographies that I'm personally most familiar with, that is parts of Asia, South Asia, and to a certain extent the Middle East, in this paper, I'm primarily looking at a handful of protagonists, teachers and students, who participated in the Salzburg Summer Academy roughly between the 1950s and the 1980s. In a reverse act of viewing the artist from outside the European context as a subordinate subject, my focus lies on demonstrating that, regardless of their national affiliation, artists came to participate in an ever-increasing number of art schools across Europe in order to consciously take part in a transcultural project of modernism, thereby critically responding to a colonial diffusion of a particular concept of modernism. The Salzburg Summer Academy in this paper is viewed against the backdrop and the significance of post-war artistic mobility and the dimensions of cultural transfer that came to shape modernism on a transnational scale. I would like to take the image posted by the team of the Salzburg Summer Academy, along with the announcement of my talk today, as a starting point to elucidate my interest in the Salzburg Summer Academy's early transnational connections. In the image, dating back to 1987, we see a group of artists, some of which are from Japan, the Czech Republic, or former Czechoslovakia, Italy, Slovenia, or former Yugoslavia, and Austria. On the far left, we can see the artist Makoto Fujiwara, born 1938. The second last from the right is Karl Brandl, 1923 to 2010. Seated on his left is Janis Lenassi, 1927 to 2008, and Milos Chlupac, 1920 to 2008, whom I believe to see seated behind the lady on the very right. So that will be. We have to go back to the archive, Hildegon, and verify this. I think it's him. Furthermore, I suspect seeing Kengiro Azuma, 1926 to 2016, wearing a hat and seated behind Karl Brandl. So that would be Kengiro Azuma, in my opinion. The year 1987 was the second year of the Sculptor Symposium's edition within the Salzburg Summer Academy, and it was precisely this core group of artists who, led by Karl Brandl, shaped the first years of this venture in Salzburg. So in here we see Makoto Fujiwara at work in Salzburg in 87, and I found a picture in your archive, Magdalena Wiecek, who also came to Salzburg, and she was also with the Sankt Margareten Sculpture Symposium, to which I will refer now. So I'm familiar with these artists through my engagement with the Symposium of European Sculptors in Sankt Margareten, established through the initiative of Karl Brandl in 1959. And remember seeing Karl Brandl seated in the group before. I would like to tell you briefly how I became aware of Sankt Margareten, for the story of Sankt Margareten doesn't necessarily appear in mainstream art history. In conjunction with my research on artistic routes between Bombay, Paris, Prague, and Lahore, roughly between the 1940s and 1970s, I literally stumbled upon Sankt Margareten. Some time ago, in an archive in Prague, I came across a postcard dated 1961, written by an Indian artist, addressed to a friend in Prague, informing him that his time in Sankt Margareten had been very productive. This then instigated me to find out what the Indian artist Ajit Chakravati, 1930-2005, was possibly doing in Sankt Margareten. Not only did I find his sculpture, 
he that he produced during the Sculptor Symposium in 1961. I also found work by a fellow Indian artist, Krishna Reddy, who participated in the symposium there in the following year, in 1962. So these are works of these two Indian artists who worked in St. Margareten very early into this venture. Both these artists, post-war and post-colonial journeys across nations, regions, and continents, fall in line with my research topic. Their unexpected journeys to St. Margareten also opened up a perspective about regional, Central European connections with places such as Paris, but even more so with their own regional geography, that is Prague and St. Margareten, Ljubljana and Graz, Klagenfurt and Vienna. Thus, when I discovered that some of the protagonists that I encountered along the way in St. Margareten appeared to be instrumental in establishing the Sculptor's Symposium in Salzburg in 86, I approached Hildegund Amanshauser and asked her if I could access the Summer Academy's archive to possibly or perhaps find out about similar networks and connections with unexpected cultural geographies. So the protagonists in the group photograph all participated in at least one edition of the Sculpture Symposium in St. Margareten, and some attended several other sculpture symposiums that occurred around the world and were closely connected to and in response to St. Margareten. Makoto Fujiwara's collaborative work, known as the Japanese Line, a site-specific project immovably connected to St. Margareten, that he realized together with four Japanese col colleagues in 1970, and here we have a contemporary view of the work, as well as Kengiro Azuma's realization of a site-specific work developed in 71, just a year later, are to this day outstanding works of land art or site constructions and hardly acknowledged in art historical writings. Manfred Bauschulte refers to the Japanese line as one of the most spectacular works of landscape sculpture in Europe. Yet what may be more relevant in the framework of this essay are the artist's biographies that are a testimony to artistic movement and circulation, or artists transcending the territorial borders of the nation and seeking to connect with individuals, places, disciplines, and ideas that lie outside their usual environment. I frequently return to my interview with the Indian artist Akbar Padamsi, born in 1928, who, like many Indian artists, headed to Paris in the early 1950s simply because he enjoyed the artistic freedom in Paris and the possibility of encountering all sorts of artists. Paris, he said, offered him something that Mumbai, former Bombay, could not have offered him in the 1950s. While Padamsi never joined an art school in Paris, many of the artists who still flocked to Paris in the late 1940s and well into the 60s participated in one, often more than one, of the many and most liberal art schools there. The international character of the Salzburg International Summer Academy of Fine Arts was clear from the very beginning, not least in its wording. Thus, German, English, French, and Italian were announced as official course languages already in 1953. Martin Fritz, however, clarifies that however diverse and international the Summer Academy's orientation, even after the opening and expansion of the 1980s and 90s, the majority of participants came from the German-speaking region. Fritz elucidates that while the academy in its self-representation continuously points to its broad geographical spread over more than 30 nations, it has remained firmly anchored in Austria and Germany. While Fritz clearly set out to mainly rate the time between the late 1980s and 1990s, thus referring to the time of the directorship of Barbara Walli and Wieland Schmidt, he emphasizes the fact that, due to its geopolitical location, Austria and Salzburg are especially suited to forging links. He continues to quote from the preface of the 1989 Summer Academy brochure, where it says that the location of Salzburg, quote, as a point of intersection between north and south, east and west, predestines the town and its cultural institutions for encounters and the forging of links, end quote. 
So enabling encounters and nurturing contacts was not only a declared principle for the Salzburg Samba Academy, it was also a guiding principle for the Sculpture Symposium in St. Margareten. This may well be due to the fact that Austria was quite isolated in the immediate post-war era. The artistic scene in Austria between 1945 and well into the 1950s had suffered from both material destruction as well as an absence of artists who, due to Nazi persecution, had to leave the country prior to the war and were generally not asked to return to Austria after 1945. The art historian Wilan Schmid thus wrote that in 1945 there was no tradition to which Austria could have connected, no development which could have continued organically. So while it took some time to fill this void, a number of initiatives were born out of this situation and perhaps the more interesting ones happened not in the capital but in the provinces, thus on the periphery. Oskar Kokoschka was one of the artists who waited in vain for a request to return, and in 1947 he accepted British citizenship. In Vienna, the city councillor for culture, Viktor Mateka, was one of the very few who tried to bind Kokoschka, Kokoschka closer to his homeland. And in Salzburg, we well know, with Friedrich Wels being the most instrumental, Kokoschka succeeded in establishing his very own art school model, the School of Vision, within the Salzburg Summer Academy. So look at Paris and the frequency of its many art schools during the late, 19, late 19th and 20th century, roughly into the 1960s, demonstrates perhaps clearly how artists from all around the world came to Paris with a desire to participate in the project of modernism. Claire Mengon, in her comparative study of two art schools, l'Académie André Lot and l'Atelier Léger, points out some of the reasons that made artists opt for a particular school in Paris. According to Mengon, between World War I and World War II especially, the French capital hosted an extraordinary number of foreign artists who generally gathered in the liberal academies in Paris, as opposed to the more celebrated ones. While Paris's Montparnasse neighborhood generally reflected cosmopolitanism during that time, the liberal art schools, such as those of André Lot and Fernand Léger, seem to have particularly strongly reflected this cosmopolitanism. As opposed to l'École des Beaux-Arts, the less formal admission procedure and the less academic teaching approach attracted a large amount of foreign and female artists to these more liberal art schools. In a study about Paris and its cosmopolitanism between 1945 and 1989, Fanny Drujon points to the importance of artistic movement in relation to, develop, to the development of multiple aesthetics and the constitution of networks. While Drujon primarily calls for the investigation of motives, the conditions and the consequences of foreign artists' sojourns in Paris, her study informs us that, contrary to common art historical narratives, Paris was still very much thought after by artists from around the world in the post-war era. Drujon points to the numerous and well-known artists from the Middle East, Europe, Africa, Asia, from North to South America, and from Australia, and she draws attention to their long Parisian stays, often in connection with developing key moments in their respective careers, and in many cases, resulting in the decision to remain in Paris. If the Kadadi, in his book on modernism in Muslim South Asia, has argued along a similar line, saying that Paris, quote, amid a general atmosphere of decolonization, had become an important center for post-colonial artists and intellectuals, end quote. This clearly contradicts mainstream art historical writing, where, in keeping with Serge Guibault, it has been widely accepted that with the late 1940s, New York came to replace Paris as the center of, for artistic modernism. So what these accounts of Mengon and Drujon, however, reveal is that the choice made by artists to study at their chosen art schools was largely connected to the individual artists running the school, along with the artistic style they came to teach and for which they were known. 
And this is precisely one of the main reasons that artists came to be attracted to the Salzburg Summer Academy. Oskar Kokoschka had a very high international profile. It was unmistakably his charismatic personality along with his stylistic orientation that made him, quote, unquote, the undisputed fascination of the school. Ina Stegen summarizes what many others have claimed to be the core qualities of Oskar Kokoschka's personality by speaking about, quote, the kind of attraction which the name Kokoschka projected worldwide, the kind of human and artistic radiation which emanated from him, the kind of breathless concentration and readiness which streamed towards him when he entered the room, end quote, and she was thereby referring to qualities that are in line with perhaps the two artist teachers from Paris that I introduced to you just earlier. From the beginning, the Summer Academy witnessed a mix of nationalities amongst its participants and teachers, and I would like to introduce to you a selected number of those individuals who are well-known artists, but perhaps less known to an Austrian audience. In 1955, the Egyptian artist Margot Veillon participated in the Summer Academy. She took part in the lithography course led by Slavi Sushek. Veillon was born in Egypt in 1907. Her father was a Swiss merchant and her mother was Austrian. Veillon lived in Paris between 29 and 31. These two years can be considered her apprentice years, where she experimented with all kinds of artistic styles, developing a special interest in Cubism. Veillon is considered an important artist in Egypt and forms part of a strong group of female artists, of which Marguerite Nakla, Efat Nagy, Tahir Khalim, Inji Eflatun, Gaspia Siri, and Zainab Abdel Hamid have achieved international recognition through their pioneering in, uh, stylistic aesthetics that were often paired with social and political commentaries. While Veillon traveled extensively throughout her life, from 1960 onwards, she regularly spent the summers in Switzerland, she was considered a local artist who deeply engaged with Egypt on many levels. The largest collection of her works are, in fact, with the American University in Cairo, and uh, parts of that collection are on permanent display there. Kafka Yusuf al-Assal, 1909 to 2009, is another Egyptian artist who participated in the Summer Academy in 1958 and in 59. I think I don't have an image of her work. In the early 1930s, she studied at the Hornsey School of Art in London and upon her return to Egypt became an art teacher. Like Veillon, Kafka Belles et La Salle spent summers in Europe, two of which took her to Salzburg. Reflecting on her life in a profile interview in 2001 for Al-Ahram, a weekly English journal, she feels irritated by the fact that values that had been appreciated by her generation had become the reason for controversies. She, she reflects on, I quote her saying, the great expressionist Oskar Kokoschka with whom she studied, saying that art, Kokoschka would tell his students, is seeing with your eyes and not only an expression of intellect, end quote. Now this is clearly in line with Kokoschka's mission at his summer school to convey to his students from around the world to see the human being as central to all things. According to participants, names listed in the archive of the Summer Academy, a few other artists from Egypt, Kuwait, and Lebanon appear in these early years. In the later 1960s, there's an increase in participants from non-European countries, and in the 1970s, this trend intensifies. In 1970, the painter Zhao Wuki 1920 to 2013, came to teach at the Summer Academy. He was born, raised, and educated in China, moved to Paris in 1948, where he soon became well-connected and well-represented in important exhibitions, biennales, galleries, and museums around the world. In 1965, by now a French national, Wuki showed works on paper at the Grafische Sammlung Albertina in Vienna, 
in a solo exhibition in collaboration with the Forum Stadtpark in Graz. Walter Koschatzky, in his introduction text of the uh, Albertina exhibition, speaks of the role of the institution to inform the public not only about art from the West, but also art from the Far East. He continues by emphasizing Austria's chance to extend its position as a bridge builder, also in the field of fine arts. The exhibition at the Albertina and the Forum Stadtpark in Graz showed more than 70 works by Zhao Wuqi. What Koschatzky does not mention is that Zhao Wuqi's work had already been seen at the Albertina in a group show in 1963. This was an exhibition titled Graphic 63, Werke aus der Biennale Ljubljana, so works from the Ljubljana, Graphic Biennale, organized by Koschatzky himself, showing a selection of around 200 works of art from the 1963 Graphic Biennale in Ljubljana. So he selected 200 works from a body of 900 works and brought this to Vienna. Koschatzky's intention then was to foster knowledge about graphic arts in general and to encourage a collector's culture in Vienna. Koschatzky admiringly speaks about the achievements of the Ljubljana Biennale and he praises the groundbreaking initiative of Slavis Suchek in Salzburg. A series of works by Zhao Wuqi are with the Albertina in Vienna today. Some of these works have been acquired as early as 1958. While, Zhao Wuqi, while in Salzburg, Zhao Wuqi sh showed his works at the Kunstverein. And in Paris, in his recent um, retrospective, he is remembered by friends as a spiritual master, as an artist with great proficiency in informalism, and as one of the first painters who dared to confront Chinese pictorial conceptions with Western techniques and materials. Zhao Wuqi's invitation to Salzburg must certainly be seen in line with the general opening of the Summer Academy towards contemporary tendencies. What took place with Emilio Vedova prior to Zhao Wuqi's time here as a representative of abstract painting between 1965 and 69 seemed to have been carried on with the invitation of Zhao Wuqi. In 1975, the Iraqi artist Dial Lassavi, born in 1939, participated in the workshop for lithography led by the German artist Otto Eglau. It was his first introduction to lithography and it is said to have sparked his ongoing engagement with image and text through a variety of formal possibilities offered by printmaking. In a recent large-scale retrospective about the artist's work at Doha, the catalog references the Salzburg experience as having challenged his practice towards an exploration of form and color, which eventually, eventually led to an understanding of image and text as a defining feature related to the history of Arab art. Suad al-Attar, born in 1942, took part in the lithography course in 1976. In the early 1960s, Al-Attar participated in the important Baghdad Modern Art Group, and her 1965 exhibition in Baghdad is referenced as one of the first solo exhibitions by an Iraqi woman in Iraq. Her work is part of many major collections, such as the Bajil Foundation in Sharjah, the Mataf Arab Museum of Modern Art in Doha, the British Museum in London, London, and the Gulbenkian Collection in Lisbon. In light of this account, how are we to read the summer, Salzburg Summer Academy's early transnational connections? How are we to read connections of artists and how are we to read motives, conditions, and circumstances of their participation with the workshops at the Summer Academy, Academy in Salzburg? I would like to conclude by saying that the post-war era is marked by an intensified engagement of artistic production across sites within newly created nation states that followed with the decolonization of regions in Asia and in Africa. While we have seen an increase, an, a welcome and increased amount of research from several sites across the globe, such as Mumbai, Lahore, 
Rio de Janeiro, Ljubljana, Cairo, Baghdad, and so on, there remains work to be done. Most of all, it remains to draw this, and I quote Monica Junisha saying, individual stories out of their isolated areas and plot them on the common metrics that would show connections but also, most of all, it remains to rewrite the story of European modernism by situating it within the larger, complex political and cultural determinations of colonialism and global connections that made its emergence possible. Following the roots of artists requires to also include the participation in off-center activities such as the Salzburg Academy and the artists' exhibitions along these regional journeys. The regional and international contexts made possible in Salzburg can then offer the opportunity to not only account for developments in this particular locality, but more so to productively introduce the geographically peripheral milieu into mainstream art historical discourse. Reflecting on cross-cultural connections of artistic ventures will help to situate them in both regional and transnational art historical writing. I've started with a selected number of individuals, and I hope that more work can be done in the future. Thank you for your attention. I would like uh, to start with a question. Um, do you know how, uh, with two questions actually, do you know how the artists became aware about the Summer Academy? How did they know that uh, they could study there? Um, this is the first question. And the second is, is it true that uh, many of them you mentioned now uh, were participating in graphic uh, cl classes, like graphic workshops? Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, for me, it's interesting because Kokoschka was totally against abstractionism, as we know, uh, but Slavi Suchik, who did the graphic course at the time of Kokoschka, was the only one who was kind of allowed to <laughs> work abstract. Mm. So these are a few questions. I mean, unfortunately, I didn't find any letters, correspondences that would inform us how, with whom, you know, these artists got in touch. Um, I think in the beginning it was really Kokoschka's international reputation that drew people's attention to Salzburg, whether it was taking part in Kokoschka's class then or lithography. I think we have to sort of not pay too much attention to that. Later on, lithography, and I would say the same in Paris, uh, graphic art, obviously there was a need to learn or to, to engage with it, its technicality. I mean, it was hardly in place in, 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 in I, I know, but India, Pakistan, te uh, the technicality of teaching lithography, uh, graphic art came very late. Huh? So that I think is certainly also the case here. When I go through the list, non-European artists would often have signed up for uh, lithography classes, yeah. But I guess that the attraction still was. And, probably in, into a long time into the academy, uh, Kokoschka's name, simply that. And Margot Veillon, she is a well-known artist. I, I mean, her Austrian-Swiss lineage may have to do with her knowing about Kokoschka. And it almost seems like the, the Egyptian artist, I mean, she came in 1955 and following her almost. Huh? And she was well-established. She had a studio in Cairo, um, where people would come in and out all the time. I mean, this probably was communicated also, because they seem to have followed uh, the years after she was here. Yeah, if this was uh, especially, especially transnational uh, because uh, of the visual arts, uh, because, you know, they don't have to have uh, like a perfect English still communication skills like we in Japan, I'm from Japan and we have two uh, important artists who study in Berlin and Paris. They both apply to philosophy but they couldn't enter because they didn't, they didn't know enough German. 
but then they study art, art and uh, uh, expressionist dance, mm -hmm. and then they imported the uh, German expressionist dance to Japan. So, most of these artists, uh, probably unlike European artists, came from um, higher higher background, um, upper middle class backgrounds. Yeah, I mean, definitely you had you needed you know, a certain budget to come here to Paris to Salzburg. Uh, I guess, yeah. I mean, that I found, found, I find even today what you're saying about language. I know artists from, you know, Middle Eastern countries who come and apply for whatever they want to study at the university in Europe, and then due to the lack of language, they end up studying art yeah. and become great artists. I also have a question. Um, I mean, you half answered it already because of the budget. Did you find out something about grants or some possibilities for any students to come here and study? No, at that time for Salzburg, I don't know about grants. Yeah, I think that was in place much later. You, Hildegund, would know that. Yeah, I know that I mean, there are letters in your archive, correspondences between, um, also printed in some of the publications of the Summer Academy letters by female artists who write back to England and America, uh, who say that, you know, my m budget is coming towards an end, but luckily the academy is also coming towards an end. So I think it meant something. You had to have, yeah, the, n the necessary means to, 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 to take this venture, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Good evening, my name is uh, Johannes Felber. I'm a, a year-long uh, sympathizant of Summer Academy. Uh, some will know me from, uh, from the scene. And I can deliver uh, two questions for uh, today. The first is, uh, in German, we say um, uh, this uh, considers uh, Gesellschaftsrecht, which is uh, judicial. So, uh, every, because every uh, conspiration in Austria has to uh, choose a Rechtsform, I guess uh, the, the Rechtsform is either a Verein or it's, uh, we call it uh, Gesellschaft Bürgerlichen Rechts. This is, ob uh, although I'm uh, many years now joining, I do not, still not know the the Rechtsform, so this is a, a, a question mark. And the second <coughs> a question is um, in the era of Wally, uh, for example, Elizabeth uh, Wörndl was uh, the, the steady uh, cam uh, camera, uh, did cover, uh, take pictures of ev every lecture. And I would like to know if she, uh, if her fundus is now available to uh, the leadership uh, summer academy now, or uh, because this uh, is the uh, the greater question of the uh, copyright and urheberrecht uh, situation. So two two questions. Thank you. We are part of the administration of the Land Salzburg, and we are called um, betriebsähnliche Einrichtung des Landes. So we are not independent. We are part of the administration. I tried to uh, be, uh, make the Sum Academy independent, but it was not the wish of our owners. Uh, second question, the archives are open, but especially with these photographs you mentioned, the copyright is not clear because there were made no contracts as far as we know. Uh, I wanted uh, to uh, uh, say something uh, to your lecture also. I think this uh, word of mouth is still the most important uh, uh, way how people come to us. And I can imagine, I think it's true, if someone comes then uh, and they like it, then they spread the word. Mm -hmm. So this is still very important, although there's social media and everything. But when we think from our point of view, it's so incredible that people know very far away uh, in the 1950s about this summer academy. Mm. And I mean, this is what the, the connect why I 
made these connections with Paris. It happened the same. I mean, there were lots of art schools, right? And people would tend to go to an, a particular art school, yes, the artist's name and the concept that he was teaching, uh, but also because friends were there. I mean, there was the Swedish school, not that it was called the Swedish school, but because, you know, the largest number of Swedish artists flocking into Paris would participate in that particular academy. And there was the Turkish and the American. Uh, so you have probably, yeah, word by mouth, as you say, you have peers who go and tend to go somewhere and you're being followed. artists that this uh, was not so attractive attractive you to mean some that artists? it reflected in the outside yeah. world yeah. that yeah. this is possible um, no I was actually looking for that also because again back to Paris it did matter you would not you know you had to show selection of your body of work to the Beaux-Arts which you didn't have to with those liberal art schools right but it did not, I mean, not that I came across any notes saying that, yeah. And also I think, I mean, I've gone through these lists and I've spoke to you today. I mean, many of these names I don't know, but like, yeah, I'm sure there are more artists who came here from, say, Asia, North Africa, who are well-known artists today. And um, I think for them, the question of whether I go to a school you know, with entry examines or not, wasn't the, pri the prime mm -hmm. barrier, yeah. So more questions? Uh, then I would like to thank you again, Simone. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, uh, invite you, there is a, a Sunset Kino tonight, which is curated by Eli Cortinas, one of our teachers who gave a lecture two days ago. So it's at nine at the Salzburger Kunstverein Künstlerhaus. Thank you.